Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone. Hi everyone, I'm Gina. Pancake Day, or Shrove Tuesday, to give it its proper name, is a Tuesday seven weeks before Easter. It is the last day before a period of abstinence, Lent, starts. In this lesson, you're going to learn about why it is commonly known as Pancake Day, and why it is a special day in Britain. Do you know where the name Shrove Tuesday comes from and what it means? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. The traditional meaning of Shrove Tuesday comes from it being the day before Lent begins. It was the last chance for people to eat whatever they chose before they began to fast and was an opportunity for them to eat whatever was left in their pantry or kitchen. We eat pancakes on Shrove Tuesday because they are easy to make and can be filled with any topping. British pancakes are made from thin batter, only a few millimeters thick, that are cooked in a frying pan. Brave chefs will flip their pancakes to ensure they're cooked on both sides, but others will use a spatula. Popular toppings include plain lemon and sugar and sweeter things such as chocolate and fruit. As well as cooking pancakes, there are many games and activities that are held in Britain. The most popular are pancake races. In these races, competitors run a short track, maybe only 100 meters or so, while flipping a pancake in their frying pan. If you drop the pancake, you have to stop and pick it up. The winner is whoever completes the race first with their pancake still intact. There is a famous race held in Oni. Participants must be housewives and wear an apron. The winner is the first to complete a 375 meter course, give their pancake to the church bell ringer and receive a kiss. And now I'll give you the answer to the earlier quiz. Do you know where the name Shrove Tuesday comes from and what it means? Shrove comes from the word Shreve, and this means to confess. In the olden days, Shrove Tuesday would be a day of confession for Christians before Lent began. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Do you eat pancakes in your country? If so, are they the same as British pancakes? Leave us a comment at englishclass101.com and we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye. everyone, I'm Gina. Lent is a six and a half week period that leads into Easter. Its date changes every year, but it always starts in either February or March. In this lesson, you're going to learn about how Lent is observed in Britain. Do you know why the date of Lent changes every year? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Lent begins on Ash Wednesday and ends on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter Sunday. It's classed as lasting 40 days as the Sundays within that period aren't included in that count. During Lent, people who observe it for religious reasons will choose to give up something as a sacrifice. Lent is also a time for improvement. As well as sacrificing material items or food, Christians try to improve themselves and live a better life for those 40 days. For the non-religious, Lent falls within the popular period for spring cleaning, and it is seen as a period of cleaning and improving the home as well as themselves. Lent has become more than just a religious event. Its position in the calendar of being a couple of months after Christmas and immediately before Easter, both big days for overeating and eating too many sweets, makes it perfect for those on a diet too. Many people may choose to give up chocolate or sweets for Lent 
for dietary reasons more so than religious reasons. Some people that fast for Lent use a Lenten calendar to track their progress through the 40 days. These are often handmade and colourful and can look more like a board game than a traditional calendar. And now I'll give you the answer to the earlier quiz. Do you know why the date of Lent changes every year? The date changes because Lent, as well as Easter, is tied into the lunar calendar and not the regular solar calendar. This is based on lunar phases and they are slightly shorter than a month, meaning that the lunar year constantly changes when put against the solar calendar. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Do you observe Lent or have any period of fasting in your country? Leave us a comment at EnglishClass101.com and we'll see you in the next lesson. Hey everyone, welcome to The Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is how to learn a language in 2022. If you're planning to learn a language in 2022, then this episode is for you, especially if you want to finally succeed with your New Year's resolution instead of failing or giving up in the next week or two. That's why today you'll discover one, the four critical steps you need to take when learning a new language, and two, how to set goals and New Year's resolutions that won't fail you in 2022. But first, if you're looking for some free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Using Opposites Conversation Cheat Sheet. With this new cheat sheet, you'll learn common opposite adjectives like near and far, hot and cold, and grammar rules on how to use these words in a sentence. Second, the How to Say Goodbye PDF Writing Workbook. With this printable PDF, you'll pick up some common parting greetings and be able to practice writing them out. Third, can you talk about cars in your target language? Learn how to say words like tire, windshield, headlights, and more with this quick vocab bonus. Fourth, must know words and phrases for public transportation. Learn how to say ticket, bus, train, and much more with this quick one minute lesson. Fifth, the 10 habits of highly effective language learners. Wondering which habits will help you succeed with language learning? Then check out this free lesson. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. How to learn a language in 2022. Part one, the four critical steps you need to take when learning a new language. Every time you start a new language, you should start with one, goals, two, anchor points, three, grammar, four, reading. What are these four steps and why do you need them to succeed with language learning? Let's jump in. The first one is goals. Everything starts with a goal, but your goal itself can also lead you to failure if you don't set it the right way. So more specifically, you need to set small, measurable monthly goals instead of just, I wanna learn a language and be fluent this year. We'll cover goals in the second part of this episode, so stay tuned. After goals, the second step is setting anchor points. What are anchor points? Imagine a small ship in the middle of a big lake. It's windy, lots of waves, and the ship is bobbing up and down, drifting all around. What would you use to stop the ship from drifting away? An anchor. And just like an anchor keeps the ship in place, anchor points keep you from drifting away from your language. So an anchor point is a connection to the language that keeps you attached to the language and motivated to learn the language. One great example is language school. Imagine you signed up and paid thousands of dollars up front. Paying that much would motivate you to make the most of your time there. It's also a big commitment, one that you can't easily back out of. And school dictates your schedule. You have to wake up early, you have to do homework, 
your life revolves around the classes. And as such, language school and the language itself become anchor points that your life revolves around. Anchor points can also be family or a partner that speaks the language you're learning. You're around them, you're exposed to the language, so your motivation to learn gets a bit stronger. Buying a language learning program or textbook are also examples of good anchor points. You invested your hard-earned money, which means you're serious about learning. Plus, you want to make sure your investment doesn't go to waste, so you're more motivated. If you're wondering if you have any anchor points, you already have at least one. You're watching our lessons on YouTube. But the more anchor points you have, the stronger your motivation will be. So if you're into music or TV shows in your target language, those can serve as anchor points too. These are things that connect you to the language and add a bit of motivation to learn more, or at the very least, understand what you're watching or listening to. We covered goals and anchor points. What's next? The third step is you must have a good grasp of grammar of your native language. Now, you might wonder, if you're learning a new language, why focus on your native language? Well, as native speakers, the problem is we know what good grammar sounds like, but we can't explain how or why our language works the way it works. So if you don't have a good grasp of grammar, the backbone or the rules of a language, then you'll have a tough time learning a new language. You'll jump in and start learning words and phrases, but you'll never learn how to put them together and make sentences. That's a common problem beginners have. Now, if you already know the grammar of your native language, how do you apply that to your target language? For example, if you're an English speaker, and if you know that English sentences follow the subject, verb, object pattern, and if you know that languages have specific sentence patterns, then you'd go look at patterns. Then, you'd have a good idea of how to create your own sentences, instead of learning random words first. Finally, the fourth step is reading. Reading is good simply because you can do it anywhere, anytime, and without a teacher. It's a skill you can get started on, on day one, on your own. Reading also tends to spill over into other areas. The more you read, the more words and grammar rules you come across. So you boost your vocabulary and grammar, which can seep into speaking and listening. If you read out loud, you're practicing two skills at once. Now we've covered what you need. Goals, anchor points, reading, and grammar. Setting anchor points, knowing your own grammar and reading are simple enough, but how do you set goals that don't lead you to failure? Part two, how to set goals and New Year's resolutions that won't fail you in 2022. The goal that you set can make or break your language learning journey. So setting the right goals makes all the difference between success and failure. Just think about all of the common New Year's resolutions. What comes to mind? Goals like, I want to be fluent someday. I want to speak the language. I want to lose weight. I want to save more money. These big, vague goals often lead to failure because you simply have no idea how to approach the goal and you don't know what you're aiming for. Instead, your goals should be small, measurable, and monthly. For example, speak one minute of conversation by the end of the month. Learn 100 words by the end of the month. Finish chapter one of your language textbook by the end of the month. If you're using our program, finish 20 audio lessons by the end of the month. All of these are small and specific. One minute, 100 words, one chapter, 20 audio lessons. This means that they're easy to reach, unlike something vague like fluency. They're also measurable. You know when you reach one minute. You can check if you know all 100 words or if you finished all 20 lessons. If you aim for fluency, you won't know when you hit it. It's too vague and too big of a goal and it may take years to hit. Finally, all of these goals have a deadline, the end of the month. That would mean January 31st of this year. Deadlines give you a clear date to aim for, and without one, you'll forever be floating around without much progress. So set a deadline for the end of every month. So now that you know how to set small, measurable monthly goals, leave us a comment. What's your small, measurable monthly goal? And what's the deadline? So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye.
everyone, I'm Alicia. Memorial Day in the United States dates back to the Civil War. It's one of the two major U.S. holidays specifically associated with fallen soldiers. It was more popular at the beginning of the 20th century than it is today, but it's still an important holiday in the U.S. Memorial Day was not always known by its current name. Can you guess what this holiday was originally named? Hint! The original name has to do with decorations. We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Cemeteries in the U.S. are usually decorated with flags on Memorial Day. Memorial Day is also typically marked by the firing of large guns or multi-gun salutes in veteran cemeteries. The families of fallen soldiers will oftentimes go to the grave of their lost family member to remember them on this day. This holiday is celebrated on the last Monday of May. Memorial Day has expanded in its scope over the years. Originally only for the fallen Union and Confederate soldiers from the Civil War, it became more inclusive of the fallen from other wars over the years. Today, it's more of a day of remembrance of the dead in general, with a focus on military members. Memorial Day parades with plenty of patriotic imagery are very common. Memorial Day is oftentimes the day, or close to the day, when schools let out for the summer in the U.S. This is part of the reason that the holiday is so much associated with summer tourism. Families that visit the graves of fallen soldiers, and those who do not, often have cookouts on this day to celebrate the beginning of the warm summer months and their children's time off from school. Memorial Day and Veterans Day are the two holidays in the United States that are closely tied to military members and those who fell in service. Both holidays have evolved over the years. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Can you guess what Memorial Day was originally named? Memorial Day was originally called Decoration Day. The name and the holiday itself have both changed a great deal over the years, but it still remains an important day for veterans and their families. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Do you have a similar day of remembrance in your country? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Christmas Day is celebrated on the 25th of December in the United States. Though it is a religious holiday for Christians, it's also a popular holiday with non-Christians as well. Parades, gift giving, holiday displays, and lights galore mark the arrival of Christmas in the United States. It's a federal holiday and is observed by every U.S. state. A famous American city associated with the American Revolution was not big on celebrating Christmas until the middle of the 1800s. Can you guess which one? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Christmas in the U.S. involves a great many types of celebration. For Christians, it means church services and social gatherings. Even people who do not celebrate the religious aspects of the holiday tend to enjoy gift-giving, having family gatherings, and feasting together. For students, it means a long break from school or college and is a popular time to go home and visit family. Putting colorful lights on one's house is a very popular way to celebrate Christmas in the U.S. Being the darkest time of year in the Northern Hemisphere, the holiday turns into a celebration of lights with complex and sometimes very expensive displays decorating homes. Competitions for the best lighting setup are fun and common ways to celebrate the holiday. The Christmas tree is another popular Christmas tradition in the U.S. Artificial or natural, it's common to see a conifer tree decorating the living room of most homes. The trees are decorated with colorful lights and with ornaments that are oftentimes also family heirlooms. There's also a national Christmas tree in the U.S., which is lit up by the president at the beginning of December. Christmas songs are very popular as well. There are traditional songs such as Silent Night, and the 12 days of Christmas, along with many others. It was once common to see carolers go door to door to sing Christmas carols, but now it's a rarity. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know what famous American city associated with the American Revolution was not big on celebrating Christmas until the middle of the 1800s? The Puritan pilgrims who settled in New England did not approve of the celebration of Christmas. It was actually banned in Boston until the late 1600s, even after the ban was lifted, Christmas in Boston didn't become popular until the middle of the 1800s. Today, 
Boston is lit up as much as is any other city during Christmas. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? In what ways is Christmas celebrated in your country? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hey everyone, welcome to the Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, can busy people actually learn a language? You yourself probably have an answer to this question, right? But whether you can or can't actually has a bit more to do with your mindset than anything else. And in this guide, you'll discover, one, is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? Two, mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Talking Online PDF Cheat Sheet. Learn the must-know internet slang and all the internet-related vocab and phrases in your target language with this PDF Cheat Sheet. And second, the 40 Words and Phrases for Ordering Food Writing Workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must-know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Can busy people actually learn a language? Part 1. Is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? So, can busy people actually learn a language? What do you think? Leave us a comment and let us know. As much as we want to say yes, it's more of a yes or no depending on the person. Why yes? Yes, because many of our members are busy and are learning with our system. And some of you who are watching also fall into this camp. But it also depends on the person because it's more of a mindset thing. Either you think you have time or you don't. For example, many of our members fall into the group of can learn and can find the time, even if they're busy. If you're busy and still want to learn, if you look around, you can always find five or 10 minutes a day, like on a commute. Now, if your mindset is the opposite, if you think you can't learn a language or you don't have time, you won't even try, even if you had a resource that was proven to work. Part two. Mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And if you think about it, if you had all the time in the world but felt like you couldn't learn a language, you wouldn't try either. Again, this is why it comes down to the mindset and why it all depends on each individual person. Either you think you can or you think you can't. But it may not always be this black and white either. It can also depend on your mental bandwidth too. Think back to your school days, those few days before exams. It got really busy and you had to stop everything to study, right? You were probably thinking, if I can just get through studying this week and take the test, then next week I can finally start relaxing and doing other things. And if someone asked you if you wanted to hang out, you would say no, because you're busy. But chances are you still managed to spend at least 30 minutes on YouTube or social media. Meaning you did have some time, even if you were busy. But the test was occupying your mind and taking up all that bandwidth. So it's also possible that we just don't have the mental bandwidth because we're overwhelmed. And this is a genuine reason for not being able to learn when you're busy. Don't worry, in the next part, we'll show you how to get some bandwidth so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Part three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. So if you've gotten this far, you understand that it is possible to start learning a language, even if you're busy, that you can find the time, but it mostly comes down to your mindset. So how can you develop the mindset? So when you're too busy, it feels like you're overwhelmed and like you don't have control of your time. 
Well, there are a few things you can do to gain some control of your time, have some breathing room, and learn a bit of language. First, always set small, measurable goals. This is something that we talk a lot about here. For example, learn for 10, 15, or 20 minutes every day. Learn 100 words in one month, which means learning three to four words a day. And the mindset behind this is just being realistic with your goals and what you can do. Because if you're busy, you may not have one or two hours. And this is a strict rule, especially when starting out with new goals and languages. Always stick to small, measurable goals. Second, lowering your goals and expectations is okay when things get super busy. If you couldn't learn all 100 words for the month and only got up to 40 or 60, that's okay. If you tried learning on Monday and Tuesday but skipped Wednesday and Thursday, that's okay. Sometimes you have to shift priorities, and prioritizing things is a secret to a successful life. You may not get to the goal you wanted to achieve today, but you can get to it next week. Third, it's okay to put language on pause if life gets in the way. Just like with that last point, you can always come back and reach your goal a little later. We often see learners put language on pause, come back later. Some even come back years later. But the key is to come back. Fourth, avoid the all or nothing mindset at all costs. And an all or nothing mindset is something you'll see in beginners and perfectionists. When you have this mindset, you'll say, language learning requires hours, so there's no point in learning for a few minutes today. But something is better than nothing, and even five to 10 minutes of review adds up in the grand scheme. And in the grand scheme, it's more important to be consistent, even if it's just for a minute a day, rather than study for hours once a week. The brain just doesn't work that way. Fifth, do you have a slowdown or relaxing routine that you do on the weekends or whenever you have free time? And if you didn't do it, you'd feel overwhelmed? Leave us a comment and let us know what it is. For some, it could be reading, watching TV, or going to a cafe and doing nothing for a bit. You're there on your own, you don't have much to do in front of you, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes. And if you're settled, you start feeling in control. And that's the point you have some mental bandwidth. You can start doing some time management and plan your week out. You can put in a few minutes of language learning. But if you don't slow down and if you feel overwhelmed, you could have the easiest possible way to learn a language. And you still wouldn't do it. So back to you. If you were busy, do you think you'd be able to learn a language? Leave us a comment. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Do you record yourself speaking your target language? If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Hi everyone, I'm Gina. After Christmas, the second biggest religious event of the year in the UK is Easter. Even for people who don't celebrate Easter as a religious observance, it is an important time of the year. The date changes every year, but it always coincides with the start of spring. In this lesson, you're going to learn about Easter and how it is celebrated. How many chocolate eggs are eaten in the UK at Easter? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. At Easter, we give each other eggs. Eggs symbolize the resurrection, a new life of Jesus Christ following his crucifixion. When this tradition started, it was bird eggs painted in bright colors that were given. Now, we give chocolate eggs to each other, and especially to children, that often have even more chocolate inside. A popular activity at Easter is to hold an Easter egg hunt. Small eggs are given in an area, usually a garden or public place, such as a school, and then people try to find them. The eggs can be real eggs that have been hard-boiled and painted, or small chocolate eggs. 
Schools will hold many events and competitions related to Easter, and one of the most famous is the Easter Bonnet Parade. For this, hats are decorated with Easter-related decorations, such as eggs, chicks and rabbits. There are egg rolling competitions, where hard-boiled eggs are rolled down a slide or a hill, and the egg that travels the furthest without breaking apart wins. Also, there are egg decorating competitions. At Christmas, it is Santa Claus that brings the presents, but at Easter, it is the Easter Bunny that brings the eggs. Chocolate figures in the shape of bunnies are popular gifts at Easter, alongside the traditional eggs. And now, I'll give you the answer to the earlier quiz. How many chocolate eggs are eaten in the UK at Easter? Around 80 million eggs are eaten by Brits at Easter. This is particularly impressive for a country that has a population of only 63 million people. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Do you have any games similar to the ones I spoke about in your country? Leave us a comment at EnglishClass101.com and we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye! Hi everyone, I'm Gina. A lot of countries celebrate Christmas Day on the 25th of December. But did you know that in the UK, there is another public holiday on the 26th of December called Boxing Day. In this lesson, you're going to learn about Boxing Day and why it is a special day. The 26th of December is better known in many countries as a Saint's Day. What is the name of the saint? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. The origin of the name Boxing Day is not fully known, and there are many theories. Some say it is because the poor boxes in church were opened on the 26th of December. Another theory is that it is because tradesmen would collect their Christmas box of presents and gifts from their customers on the day after Christmas. Boxing Day has become one of the busiest shopping days of the year, as it is a day when the big post-Christmas sales start. Eager shoppers start queuing from the early hours of the morning to grab bargains. The sale at the department store Harrods is particularly famous as it will sell unique one-off items for huge discounts. For these items, it is first come, first served. Boxing Day is also a day for sport. Traditionally, it was a day for fox hunting, but this practice was banned in 2004. Some hunts still go ahead despite the ban, but others are artificial hunts when no foxes are chased or harmed. It is also a day for football fans, as a full program of football fixtures are held on Boxing Day. Many people go to football games or watch the matches from home. With so much food prepared for Christmas Day, it is inevitable that some will be left over. So Boxing Day is for eating leftovers. Turkey sandwiches, turkey salad, anything that is left over gets eaten on Boxing Day. And now I'll give you the answer to the earlier quiz. The 26th of December is better known in many countries as a saint's day. What is the name of the saint? The 26th of December is also Saint Stephen's Day, although within the UK, it is almost exclusively known as Boxing Day. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Do you remember the theories as to why it is called Boxing Day? Leave us a comment at EnglishClass101.com and we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Columbus Day celebrates the day that Christopher Columbus first arrived in the Americas. The holiday is celebrated on October 12th, and in some cities, there are very large parades and many other events. 
It's particularly popular in U.S. cities with large Italian populations, though it's celebrated nationwide. A famous American charity organization is named after Christopher Columbus and takes part in celebrations during Columbus Day. Can you guess which one? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. In Italian-American communities, particularly in the larger cities in the U.S., Columbus Day is very much tied to a celebration of their heritage, in addition to the celebration of Columbus's arrival in the Americas. Cultural and religious images and symbols specific to Italian-Americans are abundant in Columbus Day parades. If there's one thing that defines Columbus Day celebrations in the U.S., it's the parade. New York City is particularly well known for its large Columbus Day parade. San Francisco has the longest-running Columbus Day celebration in the United States, dating back to 1868. Columbus Day in the U.S. is not celebrated in every state. In fact, some U.S. states do not recognize it at all, and many schools remain open on the day. There is controversy surrounding this holiday, and it's been changed to a celebration of Native American cultures in some areas. Columbus didn't realize he'd arrived in the Americas. This is why Native Americans are sometimes referred to as Indians, which, incidentally, some say is politically incorrect. Columbus initially thought he was in the East Indies. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know a famous American charity organization that's named after Christopher Columbus and takes part in celebrations on Columbus Day? The Knights of Columbus is a charitable organization with very strong Italian and Catholic roots. They participate in just about every Columbus Day celebration. You'll find them marching among the participants in any large parade, to be sure. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Are there any holidays that celebrate a famous historical figure in your country? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hey everyone, welcome to The Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And how to speak more of your target language. Since you're learning the language, then you're very much aware of the importance of speaking, which can be easy if you're an extrovert or hard if you're an introvert. So how can you speak more if you're on the shy side? Keep watching this month's episode. You'll discover who learns faster, extroverts or introverts, why learning a language can help you become more extroverted, and five ways to speak more, even if you're an introvert. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Sport and Exercise Conversation Cheat Sheet. Want to talk about fitness in your target language? You'll learn over 50 words and phrases for sports and exercise with this brand new cheat sheet. Second, the 40 words and phrases for ordering food writing workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must-know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. Third, the top 12 April Fool's phrases. Want to be able to say some outrageous phrases in your target language for April Fool's Day? Then you'll want this April Fool's phrase list. Fourth, can you talk about your bones in your target language? Learn how to say words like skull, ribs, spine, and much more with this quick vocab bonus. Fifth, 20 must-know jewelry vocabulary. Do you know how to say earrings or necklace in your target language? If you don't, then this vocab lesson is for you. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? And how to speak more of your target language. Part one, do extroverts or introverts learn languages faster? If you've ever wondered whether introverts or extroverts learn the language faster, there have been studies done on this. And as you'd expect, extroverts do have an advantage when it comes to speaking and overall conversational skills. Of course, these studies didn't take into account mistakes you may make, such as grammar, vocab, etc. And introverts? Introverts tend to observe and listen more, and tend to be better listeners. 
Do you agree with these findings? Leave a comment. So the key takeaway is they each have their own advantages. One has something that the other lacks. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If you speak less, your speaking skills will be weaker. And if you want to just speak a lot, you get good at speaking, but miss out on the other skills like listening and reading. So unfortunately, you can't really say who learns faster based on personality alone, just that each one has their advantages and disadvantages. But personality aside, success with a language will always depend on your attitude towards learning itself and how much time you put in. The person that has a better chance of becoming fluent will always be the one that puts in more time to learn, practice, get feedback, adjust with the feedback, and not so much about whether they're extroverted or introverted. But what if you're an introvert who wants to be able to speak more? Is there a way to become more extroverted? Part two, how to speak more, even if you're an introvert. There are ways to become more extroverted, at least more than your usual self. How? Well, first by learning a language. When you learn a language, you have a natural desire to connect with native speakers, even if you're shy. Also, native speakers tend to be very supportive and welcoming when you're trying to learn their language. So even if you're shy, it's kind of hard to stay shy in the long run when the people you speak with are so encouraging. In your native language, even if you know a million ways to start a conversation, you might not try to speak to someone because you're worried about whether you have something clever to say or the timing or some other social aspect. But in another language, where you may only know a few phrases, you're not bogged down by that. You just do the best you can with the few phrases you have. Plus, learning a language alone gives you a chance to reinvent yourself. To learn another language is to acquire another soul, as the quote goes. So learning a language alone puts you on a path towards becoming more extroverted. But if you want specific tips, here are five ways to speak more, even if you're an introvert. Number one. Learn how to listen like an introvert. How can this help you to speak more? Introverts tend to listen more, and the better listener you become, the better questions you can ask, which results in a more meaningful conversation, which also means more speaking time for you. So you can speak more, even if you consider yourself an introvert, by listening well and asking relevant and pertinent questions. By the way, if you want to learn how to ask questions, then check out our top 25 questions you need to know, where you'll learn all about what to ask and answer regarding the most common conversational questions. Number two, increase speaking time and confidence through experience. Simply put, the more experiences you have in life or experience with certain topics, the more knowledgeable you become. And as your life or work experiences grow, so will your audience you'll find people coming to you to talk to you. It could be about business, travel, or just your own life stories. If a conversation is about France, and if you've been to France, the conversation will gravitate towards you. Having all that experience makes things easy for you as an introvert. People will come to you, so you don't have to find them. For a language learner, the tricks are to, one, be knowledgeable about something, and two, be able to talk about your experience in the target language. Number three. Find the right audience. Imagine talking to someone that's not interested in learning languages. They'll give you 100 reasons why they can't learn, never reasons why it might work out for them, right? But when you're talking to an audience that's interested in languages, then you can have a conversation that could go on for hours. So find the right audience to share with. With language learning, it means you need to find native speakers that share the same hobbies or interests as you. Number four, talk about what you know best. The introvert-extrovert dynamic also depends on how much you know about a topic and what you're most comfortable with. There are topics you may not know enough about, so you won't talk as much. But even the biggest introvert can become a confident speaker. Once you touch upon a topic they know well, that's where they shine. So if your goal is to be more extroverted, then focus on the things you know about. Or you can always gain experience in topics you don't know much about so you can speak more. Number five, create opportunities to speak. How? Well, it's hard to stop a stranger and start talking with them without any context, right? But what if you need help finding something at a store or have a question about a dish at a restaurant? Then it's much easier since you're there with a purpose. So you can create these opportunities by going to a restaurant from the country that speaks your target language and speaking with the staff, or asking a taxi driver a question, or asking staff at an information booth a question. 
So to recap, if you want to speak more, even if you're an introvert, one, listen like an introvert. Two, increase speaking time and confidence through experience. Three, find the right audience. Four, talk about what you know best. And five, create opportunities to speak. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how tipping points will bring you closer to your language goals. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Hi everyone, I'm Gina. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. If you live in the UK, you will know that rhyme and what it means. If you don't, then you soon will. It refers to Guy Fawkes Day, an annual celebration on the 5th of November. In this lesson, you're going to learn about what Guy Fawkes Day is and how it is celebrated. Why did people in the UK first start to celebrate Guy Fawkes Day? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Guy Fawkes Day celebrates the failure of Guy Fawkes and his accomplices in their plot to kill King James I. In 1605, Fawkes and his friends planned to blow up the Houses of Parliament with the Protestant king inside and replace him with a Catholic monarch. However, their plot was discovered and they were arrested and later executed for treason. We celebrate Guy Fawkes Day by lighting large bonfires and setting off fireworks. The celebrations are also called Bonfire Night. People may go to organised firework displays or have smaller parties in their gardens. Fireworks are a large part of the celebrations and although the event is on the 5th of November, it isn't unusual to hear fireworks throughout October too. Another way of marking the day is by the making of a guy. A guy is a homemade dummy that is usually made to resemble Guy Fawkes himself. It used to be commonplace to see children with their guys asking for money by shouting, penny for the guy. But this tradition is not as popular in recent years. The guys are thrown onto the bonfires and burnt. The image of Guy Fawkes has become very popular in recent years due to Guy Fawkes masks being used in the film V for Vendetta and also by the online group Anonymous. And now I'll give you the answer to the earlier quiz. Why did people in the UK first start to celebrate Guy Fawkes Day? The celebrations of Guy Fawkes Day began because the government in 1605 enforced a public day of celebration. The public had no choice but to light bonfires and celebrate the failure of the plot. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Do you have any events or festivals that you celebrate with fireworks in your country? Leave us a comment at EnglishClass101.com and we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Thanksgiving is one of the most celebrated holidays in the United States. It also marks the beginning of the holiday season. The weeks leading up to Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and the winter solstice, which are all widely celebrated holidays in the U.S. For retailers, Thanksgiving begins their busiest season. Thanksgiving is celebrated on the fourth Thursday of November. Thanksgiving was founded as a national holiday by one of the most famous presidents of the United States. Do you know who it might have been? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Thanksgiving, to a large extent, is about having a feast with friends and family. Turkey is the traditional main course with yams, squash, pumpkin pie, 
cranberries, and other rich and filling foods rounding out the meal. Some families spend weeks preparing for their Thanksgiving feast, and to stuff oneself is most certainly encouraged. The Thanksgiving meal of today is rooted in the meal that the pilgrims from Europe shared with the Native Americans on the first Thanksgiving. This was quite a feast. Turkey, duck, goose, squash, corn, and a plethora of other foods were shared between the Europeans and the Native Americans. This original fate was said to go on for three full days. Football is another tradition during Thanksgiving celebrations in the United States. Watching the football game while preparing the Thanksgiving meal is an important part of the celebration for many families. Families that aren't sports fans, however, may opt to spend the time outside, enjoying the crisp autumn air, or may find other diversions to enjoy while the turkey cooks. Thanksgiving is not a uniquely American holiday. There are similar celebrations in Canada, for instance. The concept behind the holiday, showing thankfulness by having a feast, spans many cultures. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know who founded Thanksgiving as a national holiday? Abraham Lincoln established Thanksgiving during the dark days of the American Civil War. Even though the holiday was officially born during this conflict, it's more associated with the initially good relations between the first European immigrants and the Native Americans. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is there a day in your country where you give thanks? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone.